Okay, so it's very tough job to do it, have Professor Valerie Turkin. <laughs> but um, thank you for you, Christina, and the organizing committee for inviting me. Uh, my uh, talk will be much more in, in applied use of biophotonics and not on the basics. I just choose some uh, clinical needs that our partners brought to us and the development that uh, took place after studying their problems. So um, I will skip all the knowledge you learned from Professor Valerie Tuchin and uh, I'm going straight to some applications. So I came from a Nuclear and Energy Research Institute where we have a Center for Lasers and Applications. The institute is a state institute running by the federal government, government and there uh, we have the Center for Lasers and Applications. We are inside the main campus of the University of Sao Paulo. We, we uh, occupy a quarter of the size of the campus. It's a huge campus for those who have the opportunity to visit us. Uh, one day, and uh, we have a huge uh, grant course related to materials and applications of nuclear uh, technology, and the main um, task of the IPEN, uh, or IPEN, as you can tell, is to improve the quality of Brazilian population regarding health. So we, the institute is 60 years old, and it was born for building radiopharmaceutical for diagnosis and treating cancer. So all other centers inside the institute developed after that. And in the Center for Lasers and Applications, we uh, can, there's a people there growing crystals for lasers, so we build some lasers for our own uses. There is a group that takes care about industry um, applications of lasers, so femtosecond machining, microfluidics, uh, welding of dissimilar uh, materials, and we are doing some uh, ELISA tests, or ELISA, ELISA? tests using microfluidics um, machined by femtosecond lasers. There is also a group for monitoring the pollutants in Sao Paulo City is a very uh, good, <laughs> bad uh, city for uh, controlling pollutants. We are a very polluted city. And there is, we are four uh, researchers working on, on biophotonics and our uh, students. On that, we are going to talk a little bit about that. So, <clears throat> we began uh, 27 years ago doing some work on lasers in dentistry due to the fact that uh, I was hired there at the time and our crossing the street, we have the school of dentistry and we joined uh, immediately and we decided to study what could we do for them. So um, just to remember everybody regarding the structure of uh, a dent, that we have the enamel, we have the root, and we have <coughs> green light on our eyes are not good. And, and we have the pulp, and we have here the dentin with the <coughs> our nerves inside the dentin, which maintains our teeth alive. So, um, how did we get to the solution of removing caries with laser without that bad noise of a drill uh, my generation is used to hear on, on the dental office? Uh, no anesthesia is need in most of this, the cases, so it's a huge step. I don't know if some of you have been treated by um, those lasers, but Professor Carlos de Paulo Eduardo from Dental School just in 92 told me, is it possible to do ablation in some teeth with laser? 
And uh, there was no erbium laser in the market at the time, so we built an omium laser. It was my first project there. And then I did this small holes in the teeth and uh, uh, regarding to due to the fact that, as you previously noticed, in the uh, absorption of water and the hydroxapatite is very strong on the three micrometers range, but it's also there is a peak in here corresponding to the omen laser, so we could do some job on that. And then they are, are very excited to the idea of possibility of removing hard tissue with laser. Of course, one of the uh, Professor Valerie Tuchin told us about several uh, other models of uh, how the absorption coefficient can be uh, split uh, in several uh, units in here. Um, I don't work with that, but we, we just to remind us that scattering and absorption are very important, not the absorption the only um, player in this game, and also depends on the angle which the photons enter to this, the tissue as well. But going straight to, to the applications, um, we in biological tissue for a doctor, a medical doctor or a dentist, uh, we should take care about not trepassing a linear, a, a, a certain threshold uh, in order not to damage the tissue. So uh, we, we are using infrared thermal camera in order to calculate the pulse width of the laser uh, so we can not have some uh, harm on the tissue. So. Uh, there is this family of ablative lasers, Erbium and uh, YAG, in a matrix of YSGG as well, uh, which are based on the fact that water un inside the, the hard tissue, so the water is trapped uh, among the hydroxyapatite crystals, so it will uh, increase the temperature, it will not evaporate until it reach 300 Celsius degrees, and then it will explode, taking out all the crystals above it. So that's how urban uh, YSGG and Herb, uh, YAG lasers work. And then this is uh, inside of a teeth pictures. We could do some hole with homeo uh, uh, YLF lasers. And we see in, in the enamel it works very fine, but it carbonizes dentin because there is some um, organic material on it. So the, the other family of lasers used in dentistry can be the neodymium YAG, neodymium YOF uh, lasers, and uh, which can do some uh, melting on the tissue because the hydroxyapatite absor absorption, as well the other absor water absorption in this 1.06 uh, micrometers is not very strong, so we can do some melting. Uh, as well, with homeum laser, can do indenting some melting and sometimes in enamel some melting as well. So using the melting fact, so uh, the first uh, job we we did with them was to determine what are the possibilities to treat the dental hypersensibility. Funny name, but we know, all know about that is that pain when you have uh, some uh, cold water or when you have some sweet and in fact you are not having the caries disease but you still have the pain. So is, uh, the reason is there's exposition of your small nervous close to the root. So one way of treating that is just melting the tissue. So this, this is an old work from Professor Bachman here when he was my master's student a long time ago. And uh, I was treated by neodymium laser myself. Uh, it takes about 20 seconds and you have no pain at all for another 20 years. And then maybe you brush your teeth too hard and then you have to redo it. So it's very easy. So there are several uh, lasers who can do that. One very interesting is the CO2 9.6 micrometers, 
which is coming back to the market. US launched it in the market last year again, and uh, they are not selling to Brazil due to the fact we are going to compete them very fast. Uh, I tried to, but they don't sell us. And, but this laser in the past, we had uh, some access, we have some publications on that. It can also do ablation as well uh, as uh, fusion on the tissue, and uh, it can cut bone as well. So it's another candidate for that. So also back into the caries, which is a, di a disease, uh, mainly in our country, in spite of the fact that in all over the world, the caries is declining in the population. In Brazil and uh, in other countries, and unfortunately for our country, we are the world champion and carries incidents. So to, to the fact we have sugar cane and our sugar is very cheap or due to the lack of hygienic habit of brushing the teeth, wherever the reason it is, our population is uh, unfortunately the world champion carries. So uh, we, s we give some attention to that. We can uh, study, it is a disease transmitted by microorganisms. It's not the presence of the microorganism itself who cause the caries, but you have to do the lack of hygiene, you have to have time, you have to as acid produced by those bacteria who are the ones who make the caries in, your in our teeth. So we can use light for diagnosing as well for prevention of caries. So for that we need high absorption, so we already know which wavelengths I already mentioned. It. And for, for diagnosing we, we, we excite fluorescence, for example. So um, we studied some time ago several lasers, for, we do, did some um, some t uh, temperature model to study the propagation of heat, and we measured the temperature inside of the pulp to know we, if the candidates of the energy density will be harmful in the future. And then, uh, let me just try to run one movie. I'm, I'm trying to skip them all, but it's, it, it's a thief during the ablation process, and we are monitoring the temperature with a thermal camera in this case. So we, we, we see that the light will stop shortly and then the heat will propagate until the reach that is a molar teeth inside of some support in here. But you see there's no laser anymore and the, the heat is propagating very deep in the tissue. It can reach 400 Celsius degrees, it can reach even 800 Celsius degrees, depending on the conditions. But if the pulse is short enough, you will not harm your pulp, okay? So besides that, you can use those measurements to calculate the, uh, the thermal diffusivity in some material. In our case, we decide to do it in enamel and dentin, because uh, according to the books written for dentists, those are uh, supposed to be a constant, and they are really not. And it's not dependent on laser use, but can use any mechanical tool in this case, so the heat will propagate much faster after some temperature in here. So for caries prevention, we did a lot of biochemical tests. Uh, we can, for example, calculate the calcium phosphorus concentration in uh, artificial caries solution. Uh, we submit those uh, teeth on. And for example, in this case, we have the mineral loss calculated using micro hardness, which is an uh, indirect measurement of the mineral content. And we can see the solution, the, the group which lost less mineral was the one treated with fluoride and then irradiated by laser. It's a very nice work. And then we were very glad about that. We could understand uh, that lasers could prevent caries. And then as a physicist, we ask us 
why, what happens in the crystalline structure of the teeth. In the, and then Luciano Bachmann here went to the synchrotron lab and then we calculated um, what, where, where the new uh, crystallographic phases formed after radiation. So when you use homium laser, we can get hydroxyapatites in, uh, in its primary phase and then tetracalcium phosphate uh, added in the very thin layer we treat in the upper part of these teeth. With neodymium, we can have tricalcium phosphate as a new phase, and then uh, with erbium uh, YSGG, we have uh, six new peaks found, and we can see some corresponding to alpha and beta tricalcium phosphate, but the best match was tetracalcium phosphate, and then we're so glad that we can understood what happens. Uh, I thought I was explaining uh, the reason chemically we could get uh, prevention, but we found out that those new phases were more soluble. Wow, <laughs> that was a contradiction. And then back to the synchrotron again, what happens was that the crystals diameter enlarge and then uh, it was calculated by uh, Luciano and then uh, we understood that there was less surface area for the, the acid from the, the metabolism of bacteria enter. Well, after learning that, we uh, went to a clinical trial with uh, 100 patients uh, with the dental school, of course. So the aim was trying to get uh, melting on the top of those teeth. Um, we used an uh, initiator, uh, a photo initiator, to, to try to keep the photons uh, on the surface. And then uh, we, uh, after irradiation with neodymium laser, we could apply a fluoride. And the, our control group was not those just brushing their teeth uh, regularly with a fluoride dentifrice, but it was uh, like in a dental office uh, fluoride use. So the final result after one year accompanying those patients was the, the prevention of caries uh, regarding uh, not a real control group, but a professional applied group. We had 38% of decrease of caries but calculating overall, we have 68% of uh, prevention of caries over daily brushing. So it's very simple treatment and very effective. We can use also, as we mentioned before, the light for optical diagnosis. So the clinical problem was at that time to try to see uh, caries using light. So we when we irradiate a teeth with blue light and we take the blue light out uh, by filtering it, we can see very easily, uh, this is, is naked eye see through a filter taking the blue light out. It's a very strong fluorescence. We can see the presence of some lesion we cannot see when we shine uh, white light on this uh, teeth. So, we made some uh, work with Professor John uh, Gerkin, which uh, came here before, uh, using the, the red, uh, sorry, the blue light as excitation. We see different intensities in a very specific position and then small peaks over other wavelengths. We measured the lesions outside and then we cut a natural uh, teeth from patients. And then when these if you were extracted, we cut it out and measure inside to confirm it was a, a caries. And also we can uh, try to compare the similar results, this time using red light from a laser pointer. We made a small apparatus using a portable USB. Um, and then we, we saw that in the carious tissues has, after normalization, of course, has a higher intensity than the health tissue, and this way we can 
uh, do some threshold, then we can uh, find those carious tissue. Another form of, op of optical biopsy already mentioned by Professor Valerie Tukin, it was uh, to use the, for example, uh, to take a, some signal, you just shine light on a sample, somehow you detect it, and then this detected light will bring you information from the tissue, so uh, also related to dentistry. We use the optical coherence tomography, so the images are like that. Uh, people use it to have a um, ultrasound echography, so the, the photons enter to the, city, uh, to the tissue and then scatter it back, and the ballistic ones are detected. So uh, OCT is a low coherence interferometry. Um, you have next week a few uh, lectures about that, so I'm not going deep to that. So as a low coherence interferometry, we can have some phase shift. That's why uh, what we detect. And then we build uh, the image uh, related in any interface we can find in the tissue. Uh, also, uh, we can image almost two millimeters, but to use the signal uh, realistic, I would say one millimeter depth, and then we can have uh, resolutions up to four to six micrometers, it, it's very nice for some applications. So uh, in cooperation with a group in the northeast of Brazil and a colleague from IPE, we did one of our first publications on this because our colleagues need to know when they are evaluating uh, uh, some dental element. If there is any uh, interface in here with a gap, they have to replace the restoration. But not all the time the X-ray shows that. X-ray in a dental office doesn't have six micrometers resolution. So uh, we did this study showing we can see very easily the, the interface in here, we can find the gap. Other uses for OCTs to compare the imaging with the measurements of micro hardness. For that, we do um, a carious lesion artificially. There is it's a very uh, common model used for uh, dental professionals. These uh, are not our models, but Professor Jaime Curi, which is from Unicamp Dental School, uh, which was uh, our partner in that uh, work. So, and then we image with uh, OCT, it's a very small equipment from Tor Labs. Uh, so I'm mentioning all companies who are supporting our meeting today, I'm glad for that. Uh, they have several sizes, a hand pieces, and then we have an image like that. So we have uh, built uh, our own software of analysis. Uh, which show us, uh, we, we can choose the region of interest, and we can see in here by naked eye on the computer, uh, the demineralization part on the top of it, and then we measure the optical attenuation coefficient and try to see if correlated uh, with the measurements of microhardness, uh, which just is an indentation of the tissue with a pyramid, pyramidal diamond uh, tool. And then we do this sort of graph, which shows this is the, the part of mineral lost, and this is the part of the in sound enamel. Uh, we, and then we compare with the images from OCT. We can see from the image there is demineralization inside. We can see no whole, no loss of material from the outside, but inside there is loss of material. And then we can correlate it, the optical coherence tomography very nicely with a good R uh, square in here with the, uh, those um, showing us that both one micro hardness is a test, destructive test. 
We cannot keep our samples going to other tests. And OCT, in fact, is a non-invasive test. So, uh, but we found out that there are limitations. If, you're, you're, if you have too much scattering in the sample, and in some cases, other biological c tissues has, we cannot use the optical attenuation co coefficient from OCT to correlate it with the mineral loss. Well, uh, there's uh, several groups from the plastic surgery group in the University of uh, Hostel. There is also another group in the northeast of Brazil who deal from plastic surgery, who deals with a mangioma, who is, happens to be a benign tumor, but very uh, vascularized. And in this case, uh, we use this patient as our let's see, a uh, trial to the system before going to the children, which was the real project. So uh, besides being statically noticed, uh, this problem uh, is that the fact this person bleeds a lot. Anything that touching this area bleeds a lot. And also mangiomas uh, are present in the mucosa, in the tongue, so when the person is eating, imagine bleeding all the time, it's not good. So what can we do for them? So um, we are now at the moment treating those children in this hospital, okay? Well, we began with more than 100 patients, but not all of them come to all our uh, lab, which was in the hospital, by the way, but uh, all the time, so we, uh, we've end up with 30 patients, and we just monitored the uh, difference among the lesions, vascular lesions, and mangioma, and port wine stain. Uh, and with that, supposed to go, uh, with that we could see some voids and some areas with vascularization inside the, the um, the abstract of this paper just tell us we can differentiate very early port what a lesion in a child will become a port wine stain and what lesion will just be an hemangioma. So which one you can treat, which one you cannot treat, and which one uh, is probably going to uh, disappear or to be less evident with time. So they, they change the way, because in a public hospital, it's almost impeditive to do MRR all the time. So in endodontics, uh, our colleagues from dental school brought us some problems, saying that well, we have to, to decrease the, the amount of microorganisms inside of those teeth, and then we can see the propagation of heat is one of, way, uh, of the ways of doing that. The microorganisms are very, very deep inside of these uh, dental tubuli, can be two millimeters inside of it. So if you put some dye, not all the time it going to enter all the tubuli, or if not all the time visible light can uh, hit all these microorganisms. So other way of doing that with low intensity lasers and photodynamic or photoactivated chemotherapy, which this group here in São Carlos is uh, very good on. Uh, but our uh, approach was more hard way of doing killing the bacteria with heat produced by lasers inside the root canal. So we determined the conditions uh, of irradiation, not going to details on that. And then the colleagues from dental school uh, use it to treat very severe patients and they are using uh, this method. This, uh, it became a worldwide protocol. It gained, a, uh, it was a ward uh, in Germany and it was spread after that. So uh, it was Brazil who defined the, this uh, worldwide protocol. In, inside the teeth, you can see uh, cleanness on, on, this, uh, on this enamel with diode, 
and with erbium we do ablation inside the root canal and, and f doing diode laser radiation you can see the decrease of the bacteria after 20, uh, 48 hours of the use of lasers but if you don't do a secondary radiation some of them will grow again but less with the group uh, who received laser so uh, these people from dental school is already using the protocol with neodymium laser so after some time you can see the decrease of the infection inside of canal so other very uh, simple problem brought by our colleagues was can you do something in this case when the patient lost the crown of the teeth but not uh, they try to maintain as much as they can uh, part of the teeth inside the mouth so the root is still there and then uh, the reason one reason for that uh, at the inside the root canal we can see the bacteria inside several kinds of bacteria it's a very dirt root canal so even if the best uh, endo endodontic in the world treat a root canal there is some anaerobic microorganism who is still resist inside of it so they put uh, some some prosthetic and this prosthesis can be uh, out of the the mouth very easy all of us know someone who in some part lose uh, a, prost a prosthesis so uh, one thing we find out is seconds again we are talking about 10 20 seconds again uh, we can clean those tubuli just uh, putting the laser inside the root canal just before the moment of cementation so it's very simple work very easy so the idea here is to test what happens when you use some metal uh, crown or uh, glass fiber ones. And you can see statistical difference in the group was treated by laser and some specific uh, adhesive system are better than others. So that one also became uh, a protocol for the use of these lasers for cleaning the root canal before before lasering but erbium laser is kind of a very expensive one so we came back to uh, something more inside of Brazilian reality which is the use the uh, diode laser 830 nanometers high intensity uh, the condition of continuous wave 2 watts was the better one using um, metal or uh, glass fiber with this Panavia cement, which means something for the dentists. So on bone, so people from uh, implants, people from bucomaxillo, they have to cut bone during the reconst fascial reconstruction after an accident. Uh, and so um, they, uh, we are testing in this case uh, if in uh, this is a rabbit leg. If you can take a piece of the bone with a drill or with a laser, does it make difference? And if we place it as an uh, autogenous uh, part of, uh, could we get some integration faster or not? So comparing this laser with the drill, after 45 days, we can see complete the also integration of that piece of bone in the uh, other bone so it's very nice so what people from dental school are doing nowadays so they are doing the surgery this is the teeth there is the gum taking out they so they do a hole on the bone they cut the most of the infection which is the apex of a teeth and then you do some <coughs> sealing, doing a uh, fusion of the, this part of the root who remains, and then uh, you clean and you can do a photoactivated chemotherapy inside or just low intensity laser therapy inside of this part of bone loss. So we can use three lasers for one treatment and which has a very nice uh, clinical result. So 
it's nice to help people to develop their protocols. So um, thinking about the composition of bone, we have, uh, of course, hydroxyapatite, but also we have collagen to give some flexibility to our bones uh, as well. And uh, after cutting the bone, we can study uh, during, uh, by micro uh, FTIR, which I'm going to talk in a few next slides. Uh, the composition, what happens with the composition of the cut bone uh, during healing. So we can uh, set the system to show us where is the amide one band, which is the mineral pa uh, co uh, organic part, where is the phosphate band. We can see uh, the interface of new formed bone and the old bone when we cut from uh, an animal. And something I'm pursuing for uh, quite some time now is to use FTIR as a radiation marker. So uh, we had some su success with some uh, range of those. Uh, and then now I'm filling the gaps in here. Preliminary, preliminary results are not good <laughs> in this range, but we repeated in two other experiments the results in here. Why a radiation marker is important? In a nuclear accident, uh, you don't know what is the dose uh, related to the distance to the place where the accident uh, happened. So I learned from my colleagues uh, from uh, the other campus of USP, Professor Baffa, that they took par part of our ribs, and then this is the golden standard for doing other tests. So if we can find it on bone, maybe we can measure it in a fiber with FTR, with FTR on a teeth that is much less invasive. Let's see where the science takes us from here. Um, we can also do some clinical work on implants. There is a disease called peri-implantitis. Uh, when the patient, for example, tell, lie to the doctor saying that it doesn't, he doesn't smoke, for example, or if he has already some bacteria on the mouth, so they will lose the implant most of the times. Can we help them to keep the implant on site? So uh, the, the clinical need is to disinfect the implant and surrounding so we create a defect on, uh, on a, a pig uh, bone in here, and we use all sorts of lasers you can imagine. Best result are with Urbium YSTG, and depending on the energy, it can work finely, not uh, causing damage to the metal <coughs> itself, which will also not help with the, 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 the maintenance of the element inside the mouth, but we can also damage very badly in the way that it will fall anyway. So we can also help them to, uh, after, just after surgery, to keep the implant more um, stable in position, doing low intensity uh, irradiation. This protocol uh, is now uh, changed for, we have mechanical test to, to, to prove it, we have published it, and we, when we change wavelength, uh, we can do with other uh, dose or energy density protocols. And I'm trying to control the time. <laughs> now I, I'm passing to the, the, the part of the talk. We are going to talk about the whole of uh, um, infrared spectroscopy on several diseases. So these uh, work with uh, our colleagues from my center are in red, and though, though the other ones are from uh, the biology department, and those are from Unicampi. So it was an interdisciplinary group because uh, we were uh, brought this problem from the medical school. They receive in the university hostel uh, most of the patients who have burned areas, like 50% of the body area or more, 
in burn, in skin burn. So uh, people with just a finger burned during cooking are not going to this hostel, they're going to other hostel. So what they do is after three to five days of burn, they have to go to take this patient to a whole anesthesia uh, surgery and to take out the new formation of the skin with a scalpel until the patient bleeds. Why? They have to, to take out all the necrotic tissue. Otherwise, it will be like a sandwich of bacteria. The bacteria will kill the patient. The patient will be uh, dead for sepsis. So uh, we tried to do some experiments with erbium laser. It worked, but it was not very good because it um, passed some heat to the tissue, and heat is not what you want in a burned patient, right? You have their vessels already closed by the heat. And then uh, we had this idea, well, let's do in the lab first or second after the erbium trial. Let us do in the lab with a femtosecond laser and see what happens. And then uh, the fact there is a, besides that, there's a need of hospitalization which is also very important to reduce costs in those uh, cases. So just for us to remember, to see again the, the uh, anatomy of the skin, we can have in some cases the depth of the burn can, can reach until the muscles in very, very deep uh, below the hypodermis including. So uh, when we see a normal, uh, normal tissue, and then uh, we created some, uh, some burns on the back of the, some group of mice, and then we radiate with uh, femtosecond lasers, we measure the ablation threshold for that, we use those to, to, to control uh, non-invasively uh, the death of the lesions, and then we finally determine the ablation threshold for that. And then we also uh, try to see the nonlinear microscopy, the alignment of the collagen, uh, second harmonic generation. That's why people from Municampi was involved, Professor Lane and Lanes and his group. So uh, we saw the decreased collagen uh, presence, so second harmonic and third harmonic. But to conclude with that, that uh, appearance of the laser, femtosecond laser ablated burn and a debrided burn by scalpel after 17 days of burn and 14 after treatment produced similar results histologically. So that's something that said, well, I can do both. Of course, if I can bring a femtosecond laser inside a surgical room. But also, we try to see if the optical co uh, coefficient, optical attenuation coefficient, could tell us something regarding that tissue. And we just compare to the, um, compare them uh, among themselves, and saying that the normal tissue will be one. And then we can see that after laser, femtosecond laser, we can see a recovering. Uh, we should go in the next experiment, we are going to the day 21, the, the experiment that is going on this week, including, uh, we are seeing that the attenuation coefficient approaches to the normal after some days in the group treated by femtosecond lasers. And also in um, FTIR measurements, we can see that there was the quickest recovery when necrotic tissue was removed by laser ablation by monitoring the main collagen bands, which are the amide 2 bands. So uh, we are suggesting that the femtosecond lasers are useful for treating those kind of patients. And, uh, and the fun I'm having in the lab with the kids lately uh, is the uh, biophotonic zone cancer by doing some diagnostics. So 
also the veterinary school of the university came to us the, uh, the, can we do something regarding squamous cell carcinoma because they are they are doing cryotherapy in uh, animals like uh, cats and they for in cases when this cancer grows skin cancer grow on the nose for example they have to remove the nose of the cat uh, uh, unlikely a person who can take care, not touching the area, the, the cat will die very soon after that. So uh, that was the, the motivation for those. And besides that, Brazil's very sunny country, and there are other sunny countries in the world, so the, the incidence of skin cancer is very high. Most of those, fortunately, are basal uh, cellular carcinoma, which is less aggressive if diagnosed early, but uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, are not uh, less aggressive. It is very aggressive. Those are regarding non-melanoma. So I'm just telling about non-melanoma skin cancer, okay? Even for a, a physicist like us, uh, we can see that this thin layer in here, the epithelium, corresponding to a tumor, very, very thick epithelium. Even us can tell that that is very different from that, okay? But, of course, there are several steps in between. What I'm working now, uh, and it will take some years to, to have conclusion on that, is to do a staging uh, with FTIR. So just to compare the number of deaths in the world with no melanoma skin cancer. And uh, some statistics in here. So we develop, uh, we use a nature protocols chemical model of chemical carcinogenics. So it takes uh, 28 weeks with a loss of more than 50% of the animals. So it's very tough to get the approval, ethics approval for doing this, this experiment. I, I had lucky to be approval for two times, but I'm afraid they will not approve any a third experiment. So I have to use this material. So um, several years ago, we developed then a protocol based uh, preparation, a chemical preparation with uh, amino levulinic acid or its methyl uh, ester. And then uh, I have a patent on that. Uh, and then we treat those animals uh, and also using the methyl ester with less concentration. We can see after just one treatment, we see there is the decrease of this tumor, but it doesn't go away with only one treatment. And also, we monitor the optical attenuation coefficient on that. Besides that, during the treatment, uh, we monitor the fluorescence, the laser-induced fluorescence on the animals. And then we, can, uh, we are able to choose the optimum time to do irradiation, which is different from one initiate, one, uh, the uh, ALA and the it's methyl ester, the time is different. We can do it much earlier with the methyl ester. Just one example left, so two, in fact. And then uh, we uh, measure the optical attenuation coefficient and comparing to the clinical evaluation by a pathologist. And we, we can see also uh, they are coming uh, closer to the normal after some time. So can you go deeper? Can you do something more? Uh, about that. So when you use um, FTIR, FTIR imaging, or even attenuated total reflection, FTIR, maybe in the future we can go to clinic. Uh, there are some groups in the world uh, pursuing that. Uh, we are still on the lab together with the pathologists who do the uh, regular golden standard uh, histological evaluation and then this microscopic feature tells that what's happening, so keratinization, inflammation, and so on. So this is the protocol for skin cancer, so ABCD uh, protocol, and uh, the spectral pathology, uh, when you do imaging, is just taking the 
each pixel correspond to uh, one specific spectra. And then uh, with this information, we can have Raman, cars, stairs, fluorescence, and in our case, FTIR. So spectral pathology, optical spectral pathology can be used in, in several uh, tools uh, we uh, are uh, using. So the FTIR provides us the, this is a typical uh, molecular spe uh, spectra from any biological sample. So, so there is the water uh, band here, main, mainly water, and there is uh, organic part in here. If you have a hard tissue, this uh, phosphate band would be much intense. So, but the position of the bands are those. Those in here corresponding to nucleic acid and proteins in red, so those colors are related to the positions. So that means that we may maybe uh, have success in diagnosing uh, these skin tumors. So uh, those uh, animals tumors were uh, studied by ATR, just, just putting the pathologist slide in above the diamond sensor on the FTAR, and then we can get the second derivative of, of the spectra, who show us several differences among them. We, it's published a few years ago, International Journal of Molecular Science, uh, Science and then we have some, the, the assignments, and then we can see if we have some changes made in this part, it, it means something, and then you can use just hierarchical cluster analysis to split those spectra in groups. So th these are, this was the first work on the field I had. So we have quite good accuracy, but not all. And then we move to more sophisticated analysis, just studying the second derivative and doing loading plots, principal component analysis, and then we can group better the samples, and then uh, we can have more than 95% of uh, accuracy of differentiation. Of course, some of those may be our cancer, but the pathologist was not able to detect by uh, the normal pathology, but the, we should have some immunostochemical tests to see who is right, him or us. But of course, maybe there's intrinsic error on that. And also we have the first principal uh, density functional theory, the FT, and then we could explain in this tumor that there is a link with proline and valine uh, molecules to the tumor and then they are correlated to our spectra, explaining uh, their holes. And also, uh, what we are doing now, it's not published yet, uh, is also to define where necrosis is by doing the chemical map. map. Uh, and so after the, the carcinogenics, we have to discount the no tissue part on, on the cut of course, or if the cut is very thin. Uh, this was presented in, in this January and the SPIE meeting in San Francisco. And then in this uh, the tissue cut, you can see several areas. And according to the pathologist, this area is the necrotic tissue. So in this other cut, you can see also already the result. Uh, each part on the, the uh, light gray are the necrotic tissue. Uh, the, each color corresponds to a particular uh, keratin and so on. But what we are interested, can we define where necrotic tissue is by that? And yes, and then, then we can explain by the position of the spectra and so on. So uh, K means is the tool we are using to differentiate a part of the tissue. And the last one is uh, some study with thyroid, 
we made some years ago in cooperation with Professor Max Dean in, in Boston. And um, well, we do almost the same analysis. This is the spectral, uh, hyperspectral map. When just do a supervised vector, supported vector machine, is a supervised method of identification. And we can then uh, characterize it, goiter tissue, colloids, can differentiate them, not going to details in here, just to finish in here, that after training the system, we can differentiate it very easily Boschu from the uh, normal colloid. So natural, in Portuguese is Boschu, and in English is goiter. And then we can have a very nice uh, separation after training the system. So uh, we can also, we could see also the, the moment of the iodinization process. And to finish, just to do some advertising, we have some books on the field and some chapters on our other colleagues' books. And this is my group, part of it. So we have some collaborations. And uh, inside, uh, this was a collaboration abroad in Brazil. We have several um, group of collaboration. We have founded by some projects. And to finish, I would like really to thank you. And I uh, would like to quote Professor Abdul Salah, who was a Nobel laureate who found ICTP. So there is no distinction on race or color or anything for those who received the, the generosity. And Life is really not a fairy tale, so let us, uh, insane, let us tell our, our children, okay, it's okay to be princess, but it's okay to be scientists as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Denise. Does anybody have a question? Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Denise, for your talk. My name is Flory. I am from the Medical Biotechnology and Immunotherapy Research Unit from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Uh, I mainly specialize in photoimmunotherapeutic treatments for cancer. So I had, uh, I think, three questions. Regarding hemangioma, do you know if there are any biomarkers? Because I've seen that uh, laser surgery is used. So. Is there any uh, biomarker which can favor targeted therapy? Also, I've seen that uh, you presented on uh, non-melanoma skin cancer. Yeah. And then... Just, uh, I just studied camel cell carcinoma. Yeah, so camel cell carcinoma. I would like to know, is there any Brazilian data on specific biomarker which I express in these uh, cancer patients so that uh, someone can uh, develop precision medicine to specifically target yeah. SECs in Brazilian population. Thank you. Okay, uh, biomarkers depending on what you were studying. Of course, when we find the second derivative and the positions where the difference on the spectra are, you can use those to, as a biomarker to follow what is happening in your tissue, if I got your question. But uh, to to really tell you what is going on, we have to associate the immunohistochemistry test, which is beginning with our postdoc, which is beginning next, next April. So I can tell you in a few months now. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry, can I just? No, I was asking the question because uh, we, um, we spoke about photodynamic therapy. And we know that photodynamic therapy sometimes relies on passive accumulation of the photosensitizer within the tumor cells. We can also damage healthy cells. So by using biomarker, uh, we manage to conjugate the photosensitizer to this specific antibody, and thereby overcoming the adverse effect that you can have. So that's what I was um, asking if you... I don't know if you can overcome, but of course you can use Radius. the biomarker to follow what is going on, and then you, you see okay. if you, you be able or not to overcome that. Okay. 
Thank you uh, for the nice talk, for the nice uh, lecture. Uh, I am Latif Khan from Nanotechnology Lab, uh, Brazilian Psychotron Light Source. Uh, I am asking about the questions about the uh, lasers you used. You used the neodymium laser and the uh, RBM chromium laser. These are infrared lasers, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, what was the purpose? It was to produce the heat, to generate the heat. What, what, what? For what purpose you use this laser? Maybe you can use other lasers also. It was to, uh, to, to, to generate the heats. It may be uh, power dependence, right? Uh, well, as in those, uh, the, the, these lasers are emitting pulses of microseconds, hundreds of microseconds. Right. So that means we are in the linear uh, part of absorption. Yes. So you have to have absorption, otherwise, you pass through the, the in dental case. Yes. You press through the enamel and dentin and you heat directly the pulp, which is supports only 5.5 Celsius degrees. Okay. If you increase the, the heat inside of it, takes the temperature above that, you damage the teeth. So the reason of using lasers who are absorbed by droxapatite with that range of pulse width is the absorption. If yes. you're using femtosecond, for example, okay. which is not related to yes, a specific absorption, yeah. of course, femtoseconds will be much nicer. Yeah, so how, how you control the, the, the I heat? I didn't show you, we have some publications on No, no, laser. in the other case, how you control the heat? Because you said uh, that uh, if you remove the laser, the heat is also going down, right? Uh, and uh, it's going to be a lot, like 800 degrees C, you said. So how it was controlled, like to not damage the other tissues? Yeah, no, these lasers, uh, you have, they come with a water spray and air spray collinear to ah, okay. the dim. So you have to take the heat out. Okay. You, you and so also that's why we develop protocols. Otherwise, I can use the same laser in a bad condition and, and I can, can do harm. So we have to keep on that wrench who will not reach certain temperature inside the pulp or also around the root. Sometimes you are treating a canal, okay? The pulp is already lost, but you have to keep the safety on the ligaments okay. on the roof, in the external part of the root. So when you are hitting inside, the walls also have to take care. Okay, okay so thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for Staying here until lunchtime. <laughs> Nobody move. I'm happy. <laughs> we have time for one more single question. If not, okay. There you go. Please, they, a fast they are, one. They are hungry. <laughs> Leave them. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Francisco. I'm from the Federal University of Alagoas here in Brazil. I was just curious about the uh, fluorescent spectra of the uh, normal, te normal teeth and carious teeth. And I see that uh, the spectra is in the infrared range. The, the, if you excite the sample with red light, you have fluorescence in the infrared. If you excite the sample with blue light, you have fluorescence in the visible range. In the visible, in depend, the green range. Depend on the excitation. Ah, okay. But that, it, it's stronger uh, to see so the difference? Uh, there are two different work, uh, papers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's better to see this difference between carious tissue and normal tissue if you excite in the red, uh, with the red wavelength? It's, uh, yes, it's we guess so. We guess so. That's oh. why you move it from uh, blue to, because blue, there is also the problem of scattering, which is yeah. really high. So you don't penetrate it very deep. You cannot detect death, lesions in that. And if you use red light, you penetrate it More. beyond the carries included. Okay. Ah, okay, thank you. Thank you. So let's thank again our speakers.